Thanks. Uh, just check. Can you hear me at the back? Perfect. Um, so, yeah, uh, my name is Emma. Um, I work at a company uh, called CMR Surgical. Uh, we make uh, a system for robotic-assisted uh, keyhole surgery, um, and we are hiring. So uh, the link is there if you're interested, um, both for engineers and data scientists. Um, I myself am um, a software engineer and team lead there, so um, not a data scientist. Uh, so how have I ended up uh, giving a talk at Pi Data? Um, so in my spare time, I've played around a bit with um, some data science stuff and some machine learning for fun. Um, and one of the things I, I had a bit of a play with was uh, genetic algorithms, and in particular seeing if I could use those to evolve some code rather than have to write it myself. Um, as a fairly obvious spoiler, given I'm giving the talk, yes, you can. Um, so that was A, pretty cool, um, and B, uh, instantly terrifying for my job security. Um, so <laughs> if I can evolve some code rather than write it, uh, it's a little bit like being a taxi driver and being told that self-driving cars are coming. Um, it's not great. Um, if we look back over human history, we see, um, you know, we've frequently changed what sort of work we do, how societies work as a result in rapid change in technology. Um, so it used to be the case that you know, the vast majority of us would have worked in food production, just ensuring that we had enough food to eat was a massively labour-intensive um, you know, uh, industry. Um, and then we invented things like this. Um, and now you know, one person can sit in a combine harvester and uh, harvest this field as opposed to loads of people doing that. And it, it frees us up to work in other areas. Um, more recently, you might have walked into a shop and maybe you've been presented with this. So rather than a bunch of people at these tills now, um, you've got these self-checkouts. And you might be thinking, okay, well, that's, you know, fairly rote routine tasks. Um, more complex things, things that involve bits of creativity, linking different concepts, they're probably all right, right? We probably still need humans to do those. But um, with the advent of uh, particular vast physical intelligence, um, increasingly that's, that's less the case. Um, so if we look back uh, quite a few years now, um, so uh, this is IBM's uh, Watson supercomputer. So they worked on this between about 2004, 2011. Um, and they originally made it to compete at a US quiz show called Jeopardy. Um, so if you've not heard of that uh, quiz, instead of being asked questions, you are given answers and you have to figure out what the questions were. Um, so to do that, you need to be able to do a few things. First of all, you need to understand what was said to you. You need to be able to put it into context. You need to have some general knowledge to draw from, to you know, uh, back up your, your answer and make some references. Um, you need to be able to make some really obscure references and jumps between topics as well, and some weird word associations. Um, and you might think that kind of lateral thinking, again, more suited to a human brain, uh, but no, uh, they got Watson to not only play this game well, but to beat all of the human champions. Um, and they did that using a combination of natural language processing, so it could understand what's said to it, um, a massive database of knowledge, um, some very efficient data mining techniques, so they could very quickly query that and get the most relevant bits of information. Um, they used probabilistic reasoning and iterative training cycles until they got this to be producing, uh, you know, doing well at Jeopardy. More interestingly, since then, perhaps, uh, they've put this to more sort of practical real-world uses. So any problem where you've got a really large data set to search through, uh, Watson is great at. So, for instance, uh, medical diagnostics, where you have huge, vast amounts of data. You've got, um, you know, uh, all medical textbooks. You've got journals, you've got uh, latest clinical studies results, you've got you know, individual patients' medical records, registries of lots of patients' records. No doctor, human doctor, can possibly keep up with all that on top of their day job. Uh, but Watson, you can keep feeding it that data, uh, and it will never forget anything that it learnt. So if, particularly if you've got a particularly rare condition that a human might not have come across in their career, uh, Watson may be able to give them a more accurate diagnosis than the human could. Um, it's also been used for legal advice as a service, so Watson's back-end, internet chatbot as a front-end, to get uh, legal advice to people that might not otherwise have been able to have access to that. Uh, again, vast amounts of data, lots of laws, privacy judgments, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, in the classroom, you can see it being used, so it can do natural language processing and understand a question. It's got a huge data set to find the answer in. So now we're talking about doctors, we're talking about lawyers, we're talking about teachers. Um, these are really well-respected, skilled professions, and we're now saying that a machine can do uh, at least aspects of those jobs uh, potentially better than a person can. So what about uh, software developers then? Um, hopefully, are we okay? Do we, are we needed to write the code that makes these things run? Um, but as I was saying, it's looking at ways that you could uh, generate that code rather than have to have a human write it. And one approach you might take uh, is this uh, genetic algorithms. 
Uh, so what is a genetic algorithm? Uh, it is a type of guided random search algorithm. So as opposed to uh, systematic search, where say you've got all your data here and you look from one end and you keep going until you find the thing you want, which obviously might be very inefficient and take a very long time if it's a very large data set and what you want's all over there. Um, or as opposed to a random search where you say, oh, I'm just going to well, look over there. <coughs> nope, not there. Okay, what about here? Nope, still not there. And keep going. Uh, in a guided random search, you pick a point at random to look and then you see, well, what is there? And then based on what you find there, you decide where to look next. So say if I look over here and I find something that looks vaguely look like what I'm looking for, I might decide to look in the vicinity of that point next. And for that to work, um, you need the points to have some relation to each other. So if I look at this point here, the point next to it must be in some way related. The data needs to be kind of continuous. And in particular, a genetic algorithm is a guided random search which takes inspiration from biology, specifically from evolution, where we have this idea of survival of the fittest. So um, if I can run quicker from tigers or something, I'm more likely to survive and pass on my genes to the next generation. Uh, what on earth does any of that have to do with writing an algorithm that you can write some code for, you might ask? Um, so let's take a concrete example. Uh, let's say I want to evolve uh, a string containing the title of this talk. So not program code to start with, just common or garden text string. Um, so I can think of this as either searching the space of all possible strings until I find the one that has my title, or I can think of it in terms of evolving my string. Um, so if we use the latter analogy, um, what we're going to do first is we're going to initialize a population of random strings, different lengths, different characters, um, and then we're going to evaluate those to see uh, how much they look like the strings we're looking for and assign them a fitness score. So this is where my analogy of evolution, step two, has already completely gone out the window um, because we obviously don't normally have an end goal in evolution, but here we are artificially uh, crafting our fitness function to steer it towards what we're looking for. I'm then going to select um, which members of this population survive through to the next round to pass on their genes. So as a naive first guess at that, I might say, well, I'll order all the population in order of their fitness score, and I'll take the best half, and I'll, and I'll get rid of the others. The next step is something called crossover. So this is analogous to you getting um, half your chromosomes from each parent. So I might, for instance, just take the first half of one string, the second half of the other, and stick them together. There's a really basic first pass of how I might do that. Uh, I'm then going to mutate the, the child string that I've created. So this is in the same way that you get, um, can introduce new characteristics and features into the population through random gene mutations. I'm going to take this string and I'm just going to randomly pick a few characters and switch them out for other characters. I'm then going to look over my population. Have I got the string that I want in it? If yes, great, done, stop. If not, I'm going to loop that around and keep going. And that's pretty much it. So let's... Uh, have a little bit of a look at some code to actually do that. Um, so what we've got here is the uh, target string that we're trying to get to. Uh, the space that we're searching uh, is strings consisting of printable characters uh, with a maximum length of 100. So any string up to a length of 100 uh, printable characters, that's our, that's our search space. So that's a big search space. Um, and what I've done is I've pulled out a general sort of uh, genetic algorithms uh, function for use uh, so this is agnostic of what it is that you're evolving. So in this case, uh, all the sort of stringy bits uh, are up here, and we have a genetic algorithms function that we will reuse later for programming evolution to which you can pass in how are you going to generate the candidates, how are you going to cross them over, how are you going to uh, work out when you're done and, and the fitness score for each one. So if we look into that, uh, I'll make that a bit bigger. Uh, we can see... Uh, that for each one, we're going to do pretty much, this is our flowchart from before. Uh, so we're going to generate our population using the uh, spawn function that was passed in, uh, and then we're going to print some population stats out. Just This is just to help us see that something is going on in our program. Uh, so this will just be things like the minimum, maximum, average fitness, uh, and that generation, what size the population is, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then we're going to check, are we done? Uh, if so, great. Um, Print, print our result that we've been looking for. If not, let's select which ones uh, get to be uh, live on to the next generation. Uh, in our simple case, we're not going to worry about roulette selection. I'll mention that later. So as I said, we're just going to order the population and take the best half. Um, then we're going to breed them. So uh, we will here, uh, we've passed in uh, how we're going to cross them over, and we'll just call that to create some new children here. 
So, uh, having done that, uh, the things that we're going to pass in are generating a random string. So we're going to pass it our character set and our maximum length, and that will just um, pick a random length for string, and then uh, for that length, load of random characters. Uh, when it comes to breeding strings, uh, we will start with, we're not doing a random split, which means we're going to split at the halfway point. We're just going to use split string. Uh, then we're going to take our two halves, uh, first half of the f uh, first string, second half of that one, uh, and mutate it. So our mutation, to start with, we're only worrying about replacements, uh, which means we're in this bit of code. So we're just going to have some set mutation rate, and uh, if we're uh, going to generate a random number, if it's less than that mutation rate, then change the character out for a different random one. So, and we're going to stop uh, when we get the thing that we want. Uh, and in terms of calculating our fitness, uh, for each character in the output, ideally it matches our target. Uh, and we're going to penalise things that are the wrong length. So, if you've got matching output, but then after it there's a load of jumble nonsense characters, then we don't want that to be the thing we end up with. Uh, I'll switch to the terminal to run it, just because it gets me a bit more screen real estate. Um, so this, hopefully, uh, will get to us... Um, the title of the talk. So what you'll see printed out for each uh, iteration is the population stats for that uh, generation and the best candidate. So to start with, that will be something around about the right length because we rewarded that in our fitness function. Um, so if everything's just random, roughly the right length is probably as good as we're going to get. And then we should start to see some features emerge, like spaces in the right places, until we get what we want. Cool. Uh, so we have got to the title of the talk. Uh, using a genetic algorithm. Uh, so that's nice, but how do we do something more interesting? How do we evolve program code? So, um, we're going to have um, some more problems for program code. Um, so, before, I could just dump a load of random characters into a string, and it didn't look anything like my target string, probably, but it was still a string. Um, whereas if I just dump a load of random characters into a text file, the odds that that's runnable program code are pretty slim to none, to be honest. Um, so, uh, how are we going to deal with that? Uh, so you might say, okay, well, let's try and use some templates. Let's get uh, this thing that looks like a for loop, this thing that looks like an if statement, we'll kind of fill in the blanks and stick them together. And fair enough, you will generate some random program, uh, valid, sorry, programs if you do that. Uh, but as soon as you start crossing them over in random places and mutating them and sticking them together, they're very quickly not going to be valid anymore. So you might say, OK, uh, I'll invent my own language. It will consist of a series of symbols, and I can put them in any order I like. Um, so that will probably give you valid programs. You'll have probably um, unintentionally uh, limited what it is that you can program in that language you've just created. Um, so we need the language that we uh, use um, to be something called Turing Complete, because we want to be able to program anything that we would like in it, evolve code that could do whatever. Um, so what do I mean when I say Turing Complete? Um, so, uh, Alan Turing did a lot of research into the theory of computation, uh, specifically into uh, reprogramming machines, and he came up with a concept of a Turing machine, which is a mathematical model to help him think about those. Um, and so you can, what this is, it's basically an infinitely long piece of tape divided into a series of cells, and then you have an arrow that kind of points at a given cell, and you can move that arrow along. Um, and when we're looking at a particular cell, we can read the value out of it, uh, we can put a value in, we can change the values there. That's pretty much it. Um, and he showed mathematically that anything that you could compute uh, could be computed with that machine, as simple as it sounds. So not everything is computable, but if you can compute it, you can do so with a Turing machine. And when we say a language is Turing complete, what we mean is that it can be used to simulate a Turing machine. And therefore, anything that could be computed can be computed in that language. So those are our requirements then. We're looking for an incredibly syntactically simple uh, but Turing complete language. So at this point, I thought, well, that probably exists, um, and I'm going to reinvent the wheel. I'll go and Google it. Um, and I came across this site, so this is primaryobjects.com. Um, highly recommend it. It's a great collection of uh, blog posts and articles on machine learning. This is Corey Becker's site. Um, and on it, I found an article about exactly uh, what I was looking at. Um, so Corey had been working on evolving code rather than writing it. Um, and she had identified the language uh, that I could easily use for this. And it's an incredibly simple language, has only eight characters, and is basically a model of a Turing machine. 
Um, this is a point where, in the interest of not swearing at you repeatedly for the rest of the talk, I've sort of starred out the last bit of it. Uh, you can probably guess. Um, if you can't guess, a star isn't a valid character and a variable name, so I'm afraid you are about to see it in some code. Um, so the first six characters uh, that we have in the instruction set for BrainF um, are about this Turing machine. So moving this pointer up and down, changing the value in the cell, reading the value out. The last two characters, the square braces, is where things get interesting. So this is what gives the language its power and the ability to do control flow. So this lets us look at the value under the current uh, under the pointer um, and make a decision. Do we want to keep looping or do we want to skip past the end of the loop? So that gives us our control flow. Um, so what does a program written in BrainF look like? Uh, so if we consider our sort of standard introduction to any new language uh, program, so we're going to go for Hello World. This is Hello World in BrainF. You can see how it got its name, I think. Um, writing this it would be a bit of a nightmare. For something this simple, you could probably just about do it. Reading it or debugging it, um, I don't want to. Um, but to a computer, this is perfectly intelligible. Uh, this is just the same, you can interpret this just as well as any other programming language. Uh, indeed, we can write a Python interpreter for BrainF, uh, which I have done. So, uh, if we give that a demo, I'll show you how this works in a minute. Sorry. Um, so, this indeed prints Hello World. Uh, so, if we look at how that works. So, uh, we start out with something that's pretty much uh, just a Turing machine class. So, uh, basically just moving pointers forwards and backwards and getting values and cells. Uh, the interesting thing to note is unlike our mathematical model with this infinitely uh, long piece of tape, clearly our computer has a finite amount of memory, so we have a finite tape length. And that means that you can, when you move your pointer forwards and backwards, you can potentially go off the end of that finite tape. Um, so we've uh, defined a segmentation fold exception and you can throw that in that case. Um, we'll move on to actual BrainF uh, code. So this is uh, basically a Turing machine uh, where uh, the various commands that you get in the BrainF language uh, tell you what you know, instruction you should carry out. Um, and interestingly, when we initialize this, uh, we need to do something special for the square braces. So uh, if we're going to be jumping from the closing brace to the opening brace, we need to know where in the program it was. Um, so we need to basically just go and find what the matching ones were. Um, this is one of the few, pretty much the only way actually, you can write invalid brain F code, uh, is if you don't match your uh, opening and closing braces up, then we're going to have to raise an error for that, because that's just not valid. Otherwise, you can pretty much put what you want in that file, to be honest. Um, and so when we run this program then, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to iterate over the program string, um, look up each character uh, in the R, uh, sort of instruction set uh, map we've got above, and then uh, call the function that we get back. Um, so uh, we, we're going to use, if, say, if you get a seg fault, we're just going to say, oh, okay, that triggers program exit, because we have to handle it somehow. Um, interestingly, you can put, if you put different characters into your brain F code, uh, for instance, to add comments about what on earth it is doing, uh, then that's perfectly fine. Uh, by definition, brain F just ignores all of those, so we can skip them. So, uh, let's go back to our problem then. Uh, we've got this uh, brain F language we think that we can use. Um, we've, we've evolved strings to date. Uh, how are we going to go on uh, and think about evolving programs? Um, so, we're going to have a few problems now that we didn't before. Um, so, we can potentially uh, have invalid programs, as we've just seen, if you haven't matched up those square braces. Um, we can have programs that never end. If we're generating them randomly, there's a decent chance something will have an infinite loop in it. Um, we're just going to have to define a cutoff point and say if it's not stopped by then, probably it's not going to, um, and time those out. Um, in either of those cases, we're going to give it a super low fitness score um, in order to weed out those ones pretty quickly and try and to get onto something that actually produces some output. So, uh, let's have a look at evolving programs. So. So there's not too much new code um, because we can still use uh, sort of our general purpose run genetic algorithm uh, function that we had before. Uh, we just need to feed it some different functions for the interesting bits. Um, so generating random programs, this is just a 
generating strings again. Um, I have, rather than just had the eight basic uh, brain F characters, kind of put in somewhere you've got many in a row. Otherwise, it's really frustrating watching it evolve and put pluses and minuses alternately and cancel each other out. So to give it some chance of actually doing something useful, I've kind of weighted the command set a little bit. Um, breeding programs. So this will just be um, the same thing. We'll be crossover strings again. Um, what I have done is make replace only false. So if we go back to how we were doing the mutations, um, I need to make this a little bit more interesting uh, for uh, program code. So what we've got here is rather than the thing that we are evolving and scoring the fitness being one and the same, in this case we're going to... Oh, I should have said what the program was going to do. My bad. <laughs> we're going to evolve a program uh, to output. I would have said hello world, but that's probably not going to converge in the time of the talk, so it's just going to do hi. Um, so we're going to figure out if we've got to that uh, program by looking at the output it produces and seeing how close it is to our target output. Um, so this now means uh, that the thing we're scoring is a program output, but the thing we're evolving is program code. So we can have output that's potentially very close, but the program code's kind of stuck in an awkward local minima somewhere. So we need to be able to give it a bit more of a kick to potentially get out of those. So we introduced some sort of wider variety of ways to mutate this. So as well as just replacing characters, uh, we're also going to say you can insert them, you can delete them, that kind of stuff. Uh, similarly, when we do the selection, um, we will... Um, did I put the selection? Oh, it is inside breed. Cool. When we do the selection, we're going to set uh, the uh, roulette selection that we briefly came across earlier to true. Um, so, in that, um, so for roulette selection, you can think about this as a kind of pie chart where each member of the population has a wedge on it, and it's going to have a larger wedge if the, that member has a higher fitness score. And then we're going to kind of spin a spinner on it to pick which one survived to the next round. So rather than just picking the fittest half, which might seem like a great idea, but then might kind of be a little bit too elitist and narrow us down really quickly on this path, which might ultimately not go anywhere, we're going to let some of the ones with lower scores have a chance of getting it to the next generation too, because that pathway might actually lead to something interesting in the end. Um, so we're going we're to add that in. Um, so, uh, that's how we're going to read our programs and generate them. We're going to stop uh, when this target program output is what we want. Um, in order to calculate the fitness, uh, what we're going to do is run the program to grab that output. So we redirect it out to grab it. Uh, as I said, if it times out or if you get this, um, you know, it can't run because square braces don't match up, we're just going to give it a really, really bad fitness score. Um, otherwise, we're going to get the output and calculate the fitness from it. So... Uh, to calculate fitness, again, we're basically going to reward do the characters match and take some off if the length is done. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, so if we give that a go, uh, and this is where we really do cross our fingers because this is a random demo. Um, let's see if that works. Um, so as expected, we're starting off with a load of invalid stuff. Hopefully, they will start to weed out pretty quickly. That's kind of expected. If you're just generating random stuff, odds are your square braces don't match. We should get to some output reasonably quickly. Um, kind of going to stick around letters that are close in the alphabet, given how we did our fitness scoring. Um, and we've got two... <laughs> yeah. Don't involve your programs. Um, we've got to two letter ones reasonably quickly. Um, oh. And we've got to high. Um, um, uh, so that's, that's uh, evolving some code uh, which, which just outputs some uh, text to screen. Um, I was just doing it for fun, so I kind of stopped at this point. Uh, if you go back to Corey Becker's site, she took it a bit further, so she generated uh, code in BrainF that would uh, calculate Fibonacci numbers, take in input numbers and add them up, run through... Uh, how many green bottles of beer on the wall to more numbers than any human would have patients to count. Um, lots of more interesting things. Um, a genetic algorithm in general, uh, rather than just evolving code, uh, which, as you can see, no one wants to maintain this code. We're probably not going to start writing. It's not going to replace me too soon. Um, but they, are, they do have their uses still. So in terms of searching a really large search space um, where you've got lots of different parameters you want to tune, um, they're very helpful. So for, I think I first saw them... Um, well, I did my undergrad, so I'm not, I didn't do computer science, I did uh, chemistry. Um, my final year project involved molecular self-assembly and you designing molecules such that they will assemble into things. And so you have to decide, well, where will I put the molecular binding sites on it? 
Um, and there's so many options. You can uh, run simulations where you use genetic algorithms to try out lots of different spots that you could put these binding sites on and see what's going to work and then only make the molecules that will work rather than spend loads of time in the lab trying it out. Similarly, um, anything where you've got lots of different uh, parameters that you want to try options for. So um, I think I've seen someone they had lots of hyperparameters for their neural network and they need to find some good values somehow. You could use a genetic algorithm to search the space. And the thing where lots of parameters and you want to search to see what's good. Uh, so the code, uh, if you're interested in it, uh, can be found on GitHub. Um, also on Twitter, but realistically I don't use Twitter, so probably don't bother adding me on Twitter. Uh, but the GitHub link is there um, and any questions.